Okay, thank you. Uh, Deepak, we'll start now. Let me just uh, introduce you to the audience. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are, sir. You are. Yeah. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, maybe good evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Bele Damodeshane. I'm the managing editor of Microsia Journal. Today we are going to have, have an online training on uh, mushroom cultivation. This, is, this training is mainly for the beginners. If you are already an expert in uh, mushroom cultivation, probably you can skip it. But if you are a, if you are not very much into mushroom cultivation, you are a beginner. So this is an this will be an interesting workshop for you to understand about mushrooms, mushroom cultivation. And uh, Deepa is the guy. I mean, who is gonna uh, teach you about mushrooms, mushroom cultivation, and uh, about Deepak, uh, Dr. Mr. Deepak Gowda is the founder of Fungipedia. I met uh, Deepak a uh, couple of months, maybe two or three months back, on Instagram, and uh, I. Uh, and I came to know that uh, he he has a company named Fungipedia and um, uh, he is from Mysore. Uh, then I invited him to our, our Micro Asia network. That's a WhatsApp WhatsApp group. Uh, there he expressed that he is uh, he's, he's willing to do a free workshop on on mushroom cultivation to the interested microfiles. And I was very much uh, into that point and I just uh, chased him and I just got him here to train you here or train you guys on my mushroom cultivation. Thank you Deepak for agreeing. So, no problem, my pleasure. Yeah, and it's a brief, uh, brief, about, brief, introdu um, brief uh, introduction about uh, Deepak. Uh, Deepak is from Mysore, uh, which is in uh, Karnataka state of India. Uh, Deepak did his bachelor's degree from uh, bachelor's degree in science from Maharaja first grade college in Mysore one of the prestigious colleges of that area. Then he went on to do masters in science in microbiology from Dayanand Sagar uh, institution in Bangalore, which is also in Karnataka in India. Uh, later on, he worked for a FMCG uh, company uh, for two years. After that, he spent three years uh, learning the tricks of mushroom cultivation uh, in uh, Bangalore and Pune. And he says, uh, his CV says, uh, he has got the experience in working for grassroots small scale mushroom cultivation projects. Okay. Uh, with this, uh, I invite, I officially invite uh, Mr. Deepak Gauda, founder of Fungipedia, to start this workshop. Thank you, Deepak. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that introduction. So, welcome all. Uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, so, welcome to this free workshop on mushroom cultivation for beginners. Uh, this is this workshop is brought to you by Mycoasia Journal of Modern Mycology and Fungipedia. My name is Deepak Gowda, and as Sir said, uh, I am the founder of Fungipedia. I work. I, I've done my masters in microbiology. I work as a mushroom spawn maker, and I also have some years of experience in uh, cultivating mushrooms on smaller scales. Yeah, so I, I see here, uh, I saw the registration forms of this workshop and I saw that uh, a lot of you are, uh, you know, are from a strictly scientific background. There are some PhD holders here, there are some research scholars and, you know, people who are very closely associated with the field of uh, microbiology and uh, work from a scientific background, basically. But there are also some people who are uh, attending this workshop who are not strictly from a scientific background. And uh, keeping that in mind, I've made sure to make this uh, workshop in such a way that any layman will be able to understand and do mushroom cultivation. So, you know, we, we are not going to focus very strictly on the uh, scientific, uh, behind uh, on the hard science that is involved in mushroom cultivation, but instead we will be focusing more on the practical steps that one needs to take in order to grow mushrooms. All right. So, uh, you know, let me just tell you a little bit very quickly about what Fungipedia is. Uh, so Fungipedia is an educative online portal. We want to connect the Indian people with mushrooms. We educate people about the art of mushroom growing and the wonderful benefits that fungi have to offer us. And uh, by doing this, we expect that we will be able to uh, eliminate the consumer resistance among Indians regarding the use of mushrooms in their diet. So, you know, in India, we don't have a lot of mushroom consumption. We are not very familiar with the consumption of mushrooms and we that's the problem we are trying to fix. 
and we uh, we at fungipedia we sell mushroom growing kits we sell mushroom spawn and we are also looking forward to making value added products like pickles and cookies and things like that with the mushrooms that are grown locally so that is what fungipedia is and so let's begin this workshop now uh, so uh, after taking this workshop you will be able to learn uh, what a mushroom is what fungi are and uh, you, you know uh, we need to first learn the biology and the life cycle of mushrooms and fungi in order to have a strong understanding of the things that will be taught later in, in this course and next we will learn about the significance of mushroom cultivation why should we be doing mushroom cultivation what benefits does it offer and uh, we will also learn a little bit about the history of mushroom cultivation some market statistics and we will also learn about the scope and challenges that are involved and next we will uh, learn the basic steps behind the cultivation of all mushrooms so i believe that there are four steps um uh, and if you understand the principle uh, and the logic behind these four steps then you will be able to understand mushroom cultivation really well uh, and lastly we are going to discuss step by step procedures for growing beginner friendly varieties of mushrooms which are oyster mushrooms and milky mushrooms see guys uh, in india uh, uh, the most consumed variety of mushrooms are the button mushrooms followed by oyster mushrooms and milky mushrooms yeah uh, since button mushrooms is very complicated and uh, it, it's not really a beginner friendly variety of mushroom we will we will talk about button mushrooms but uh, you know we are going to mainly focus on these two beginner friendly varieties of mushrooms okay so uh, let's get right into it so the first question is what is a mushroom so by definition a mushroom yeah. is a sir am i audible to everyone yes deeper you are audible please continue okay okay so the definition of mushroom is that a mushroom is a spore bearing fruit body of some of the organisms belonging to the kingdom of fungi so just like how there are uh, kingdoms for animals and plants so there is also another kingdom called fungi and some of the organisms which belong to this kingdom of fungi are capable of producing fruit bodies and it is it, it's these fruit bodies that are identified as mushrooms the biological role of a mushroom is to spread spores of the fungus into the environment so uh, a mushroom is uh, produced with the intention of producing spores of the fungus you know so that the fungus can make more copies of itself uh here's another analogy to uh, make you understand better uh, just how plants make fruits to spread their seeds fungi in a similar fashion make mushrooms to spread spores i i hope that analogy is clear uh, plants make fruits to spread sp seeds and mushrooms uh, i'm sorry uh, fungi make mushrooms to spread spores similarly so moving on to the next slide so we just learned that uh, mushrooms are fruit bodies of fungi so now the question arises what are fungi so uh, let me just explain that to you with this uh, picture right here um, so this picture is depicting the five kingdoms of life uh, recently they were classified it into a six uh, recently they made it into a six kingdom classification i understand that but uh, for the sake of this workshop we are going to just have a look at the uh, five kingdom classification so the five kingdoms under this classification are monera protista plants animals and fungi so uh, first we'll uh, talk about the kingdom monera the monera kingdom is uh, primarily comprised of uh, organisms like bacteria um, they are uh, prokaryotic they are unicellular they are sometimes autotrophic and sometimes heterotrophic they are they are found in both motile and non motile form and they reproduce asexually next we have the kingdom of protists so protists are are slightly more developed than monera which means they are eukaryotic they are uh, found in both unicellular and multicellular forms 
they are known to be autotrophic and heterotrophic and they are also capable of sexual and asexual modes of reproduction so these two are the uh, microscopic kingdoms and on on the top uh, we have the three macroscopic kingdoms which are plants animals and fungi so we all know plants plants are eukaryotic they are multicellular they are all exclusively photosynthetic they are non motile and they also produce sexually uh, next we have the kingdom of animals animals are eukaryotic they are multicellular they are heterotrophic they are motile and they are capable of sexual mode of reproduction so lastly we are coming to the kingdom of our interest so fungi fungi are eukaryotic they are multicellular they are heterotrophic they they do not produce their own food they are heterotrophic they are they are non motile and they are also capable of sexual mode of reproduction so there you have it fungi is a kingdom in its own and uh, the the organisms which belong to this kingdom are uh, mostly saprophytic decomposers and uh, the biological significance of the kingdom of fungi is that uh, they are known to uh, degrade uh, uh, substrates and uh, break them down into simpler forms so that other living beings can absorb them yeah so uh, that is so what fungi are so next we are going to have a look at the life cycle of a mushroom here you can see a mature mushroom it has a long stipe and a cap on the top and underneath the cap you can see these lines radi radiating out outward and these structures are called the gills of a mushroom so it is from these gills that uh, uh, the mushroom drops spores into the environment uh, and and once the spores are released into the environment hey, the <laughs> i think somebody left their microphone on you can continue i'm muted okay okay so uh, so the mushrooms will uh, drop spores into the environment these these spores are microscopic and uh, they are going to get carried in air currents to far off locations and once uh, these spores enter uh, an environment where they find both uh, good food and good climate then they will begin their germination process uh, so the the spores will germinate uh, they they begin to grow a uh, tubular long, uh, filamentous uh, growth um, and and once this uh, reaches a certain stage it's going to look like a white cottony appearance if you ever seen some white uh, fungus growing on an old piece of bread or something that is decaying that is essentially what uh, the mycelium is so the mycelium is the vegetative body of the fungus and and once this mycelium has established itself uh, comfortably what it's going to do is now it uh, it's established it wants to make more copies of itself so uh, under the right climatic conditions it's going to form little white knot like uh, formations on the mycelial body and it it's these knots that are later going to develop into a full mushroom again so there you have it a uh, mushroom will drop spores spores will find a suitable environment where they germinate and they develop into a uh, mycelium and the mycelium when it's established itself and the conditions are right it's going to form pri primordia and these primordia will later develop into a mature mushroom again and that is the life cycle of a mushroom so here we have this very beautiful clip of uh, two mushrooms dropping spores into the environment so uh, you can see the two mushrooms here and you i'm sure that you are visualizing the spores uh, dropping into the environment but you, what you should also observe that these two mushrooms are growing on a piece of wood so the so the fungus would have first colonized this piece of wood and after colonizing when it's uh, you know it's comfortable then then it will grow mushrooms it will produce mushrooms and these mushrooms will drop spores into the environment these spores will travel to far off locations and colonize other pieces of wood just like this again so yeah the this uh, clip is showing all three stages of the 
all three stages of its life cycle essentially yeah so i hope that is clear about uh, the life cycle of a mushroom <coughs> excuse me so uh, current est current studies estimate that there are more than a million species of fungi and uh, there may be about 140000 species of fungi that are capable of producing mushrooms and uh, and among these uh, 140000 uh, around 3000 species may be considered as edible and uh, 200 of them are experimentally grown 100 of them are economically cultivated uh, 60 of them are commercially cultivated and 10 species are cultivated on an industrial scale so this this uh, progression is of the scale of uh, uh, mushroom cultivation i suppose and about <coughs> excuse me uh, and about 2000 species have been suggested to possess medicinal properties okay uh, now let's uh, talk about what is mushroom cultivation and why is it important right so mushroom you just saw the life cycle of a mushroom in nature so when man tries to replicate this life cycle in under man made conditions with the uh, intention of harvesting mushrooms for food is when this is called mushroom cultivation so uh, what are, what's the significance and why should we be doing it right so mushroom farming is more sustainable than traditional vegetable farming systems it does not pollute soil or water so you know we we produce a uh, we grow a lot of vegetables and crops to feed our huge population and uh, farmers in india are known to use chemical fertilizers and pesticides and insecticides on their farms um, these chemicals essentially they uh, they uh, they can degrade the soil they can enter into the water bodies and pollute them and they can also enter the food chain and get into our own bodies also uh, and what mushroom farming uh, does is that it oversteps all these problems because uh, mushrooms are not uh, grown using soil and uh, they're, they're grown very sustainably yeah um, and mushroom cultivation gives us an excellent opportunity to utilize easily available agro wastes and turn them into protein rich food so doing mushroom cultivation um, has uh, is like hitting two birds with one stone essentially on the one hand you have utilized the uh, widely available agricultural waste into doing something useful and on the other hand you are also growing uh, protein rich food and uh, i suppose you can also say that it's like hitting three birds with one stone because uh, once you use this uh, agricultural waste to grow mushrooms the spent uh, agro waste can now further be used to make compost you know which will again revitalize our soil so you know mushroom uh, mushroom cultivation utilizes agricultural wastes it grows protein rich food and uh, you know if you if you uh, if you use the spent uh, agricultural waste from mushroom growing you can also make compost to revitalize the soil yeah so that is why we should be doing mushroom cultivation on a bigger scale so here we have this beautiful picture of uh, mushroom cultivation being done in paris inside caves uh, during the 18th century yeah so uh, back <coughs> excuse me so back in the 18th century we did not have a lot of high end equipment we did not have the infrastructure but uh, Europeans had found out that uh, caves serve as a perfect environment to do mushroom cultivation in. Yeah, so that's another fun fact. So uh, mushrooms existed on this planet before any animal. So uh, it is phylogenetically known that uh, mushrooms arrived on this planet earlier than men. And uh, yeah, uh, so that it, it's very much possible that we have directly evolved from a mushroom is uh, is what they say, and uh, <clears throat> and also mushrooms have been used by our ancestors even before they started using language. 
even before we became homo sapiens when we were still apes we were we were known to forage food from the environment and mushrooms would have probably been on our menu and uh, for thousands of years a lot of trial and error has been done by uh, uh, humankind uh, regarding which mu mushrooms are edible which are poisonous which are medicinal uh, things like that and uh, <clears throat> So the artificial methods of cultivating mushrooms was first discovered by the Chinese civilization in 600 AD. So uh, no surprises there. You know, uh, the Chinese uh, civilization has valued uh, medicinal mushrooms uh, very greatly. And uh, even today, China is the top consumer and producer of mushrooms. So naturally, it was they who uh, first discovered ways of cultivating mushrooms artificially. So although it was the Chinese civilization who discovered uh, mushroom cultivation, it was the Europeans who popularized uh, mushroom cultivation. Uh, and it was they who took mushroom cultivation to the world. You know, Europeans are very enterprising people. And uh, yeah, they, they had an easy time uh, taking mushroom cultivation to the world. In India, uh, the, the Indian government funded the first scheme on button mushroom cultivation in 1961 through ICAR, which is the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. Um, so, uh, so, you know, Indians were relatively late to explore the benefits of uh, mushrooms. Although mushrooms had been consumed in the Indian subcontinent, you know, as, uh, as we, we were also known to forage, um, but however, the first government funded scheme only uh, came into play at uh, after 1961. <clears throat> so, uh, in the next slide, we are looking at a bar graph of the state wise uh, mushroom production in India. Uh, in this graph, uh, Punjab is leading with uh, the most mushroom production, followed by Odisha, Haryana, Maharashtra, and henceforth, as you can see. And uh, you can also visualize from this graph he, how the production of mushrooms is split among the states with respect to the varieties as well. You know, if you notice closely, you can see that the green part of the uh, bar graph, which is representing the button mushrooms, contributes to more than 75% share of the total mushroom production in India. And uh, uh, followed by oyster mushrooms. Uh, after button mushrooms, it is oyster mushrooms that are most popular in consumption. And then it is, it's the milky mushrooms. Yes, so uh, yeah, and, and the other mushrooms are also grown in India like paddy straw. Yeah, the, they are quite popular in states like Odisha and West Bengal. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Here we here we are uh, looking at the world's mushroom production share, and uh, leading this chart is China with forty one percent of the world's mushroom production share. So as I told you earlier, China is known to consume a lot of mushrooms. They value their uh, medicinal benefits highly. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's known that they are the both the top producers and consumers of mushrooms. So after China, we have Italy, USA, Netherlands, and as you can see here, that India is on the latter, uh, the right end of this graph, with just zero point one six percent of the world's mushroom production share, which is actually I find that it is a bad thing, and and we should be uh, growing more mushrooms actually, and and I'll tell you later in the course ki why we should be uh, growing more. So the third graph is of the world consumption of uh, mushrooms. You know, again, we are seeing here that uh, Netherlands spends the most money uh, to uh, grow and have mushrooms. And then we have China, then Ireland, USA, Europe, Germany. And you can see India has a very negligible amount of mushroom consumption. The per capita consumption of mushrooms is uh, known to be around three to four to five kilos in uh, 
western and, and and more developed countries but in india the per capita consumption is less than 50 grams which is uh, quite worrying and uh, since the trend of mushroom consumption has seen very slow rate of growth in india farming of mushroom has not caught up with the global trend yeah okay uh, moving on to the next slide we are having a look at the scope of mushroom cultivation in india so india has a very high population so we have a population of uh, 1.4 billion people we have a lot of mouths to feed here and we grow vegetables and crops to feed all these 1.4 billion people and in the process of growing vegetables and crops for so many people we also produce a lot of agricultural wastes you know uh, whenever you're growing a, uh, a crop like rice or wheat you know only only maybe five percent of the plant body is the actual crop and the rest is all agricultural residue that is going to go into waste so there is an abundance of agricultural waste in india and and these agricultural wastes are actually the raw materials for us to grow mushrooms with yeah so that is another plus point and labor is cheaply available in india we as, as i said before we we have high population which means that labor can be found relatively easier compared to other um, western countries and mushroom growing is a sustainable method of growing highly nutritional nutritious food for the people who need it as i told you earlier you know mushrooms don't pollute the soil um, they in fact um, provide us a way to manage the agricultural waste efficiently so they are incredibly sustainable incredibly sustainable i feel and uh, they also have a very low carbon footprint on the nature so yeah we should be doing more mushroom cultivation and mushrooms can be grown by farmers with less land too with integrations of vertical farming practices you know mushrooms don't require soil but they also don't require sunlight so uh, it's it's a horticultural crop which can be grown indoors and in india you know after every generation the amount of the area of land owned by farmers it keeps getting smaller and smaller because yeah as you can imagine and uh, so you know mushroom farming is something that can be done by farmers even with less land mushroom cultivation can provide employment and additional sources of income to farmers uh, while also utilizing the cheaply available raw materials you know naturally farmers uh, are, in, are in the close vicinity of a lot of agricultural waste and if we taught them how they can utilize these wastes in a proper manner then mushroom cultivation can serve as a source of additional income to these people so that is the scope of mushroom cultivation in india um on the next slide i have listed some challenges that people face uh, uh, during uh, while, while doing mushroom cultivation so uh, there is a lot of consumer resistance in india regarding the use of mushrooms some people think that mushrooms are non vegetarian some people think that are uh, that mushrooms are toxic they're poisonous and uh, so uh, as indians we are just not familiar with the use of mushrooms and that is why there is a lot of uh, miscon misconceptions about mushrooms excuse me and uh, there is also a lack of awareness about the benefits of consuming mushrooms so i just told you uh, about how mushrooms are sustainable and they are good for you know the soil ecology and uh, these benefits are not Uh, known to the common consumer and uh, you know the consumer is not really educated about these benefits so yeah if, if uh, we put an effort into educating the the ordinary consumer about these benefits then he will be uh, certainly more open to trying this uh, trying mushrooms in his diet and there is a lack of skills among farmers on marketing their produce yeah farmers so uh, the indian farmer thinks that uh, once the mushrooms are grown the his efforts would end there but that is not the case um you know mushrooms are not sold at your apmc yards <clears throat> and a little bit of marketing effort has uh, uh, a little bit of marketing effort is also required for the farmer to sell his mushroom 
so yeah something needs to be uh, done about uh, how he is going to market the mushrooms as well there is a lack of guidance and outdated information out there um, so uh, there are some institutions uh, which supposedly help uh, <clears throat> there are some institutions that support supposedly help the farmers to learn mushroom cultivation but uh, you know they just teach you how to do mushroom cultivation but they don't actively contribute into making mushroom cultivation beneficial for the farmer you know only when the farmer is uh, benefited uh, in terms of making a profit only then will this whole model work yeah and also there is a shortage of capital to upscale growing operations um yeah so mushroom cultivation when it's on the smaller scale it's fine but you know it's a, it's a labor intensive job and eventually the farmer would have to scale his operations and for upscaling his operations it's going to require a lot of capital uh, which can be a challenge for, for many farms Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Deepak just called me to inform that uh, you know they, there has been a power cut in this area. He'll be back uh, in um, two or three minutes. We'll take a break of uh, you know five minutes and we'll come back. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, sir. That's fine. I will take a five minutes break and we'll be uh, by, by by that time Deepak should be available. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any any questions, uh, please type in the chat box. Uh, when Deepak is back, uh, we'll ask him. Okay. Hello. 
Hello, uh, I'm very sorry, everyone. Uh, I'm experiencing a lot of power cuts here, so I've just uh... okay. You are deep back, no? Good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm back. I'm. I'm just uh, going to get back to the slides again. Please give me one moment. Sure. Take your time. <laughs> Deepak, let me wait for a couple of minutes. Deepak. Sir, yes, sir. So uh, I'm audible please to everyone. Go back to the challenges part. Wait for a couple of minutes because I had I have I had announced a break of five minutes. All right, sir. All right, sir. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Ladies and gentlemen, can we resume the talk presentation? Please let me know. Type in the chat box, please. Are you back, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Deepak, please continue. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'm going to continue now. Uh... So we just talked about, uh, sir. Uh, just, just one more minute, sir. Just, just one second. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, sir. So, so uh, uh, can I resume, sir? Yeah. Please continue. Okay. Okay. So we were just uh, talking about challenges in mushroom cultivation. Uh, so I think what I was trying to say that there is a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lack of guidance and uh, the information is sometimes a little bit outdated uh, uh, for the farmer. So yeah, uh, there, there is clearly a gap uh, for uh, knowledge regarding mushroom cultivation among the farmers. <clears throat> Also, uh, the farmer might also face some shortage of capital uh, while uh, doing his mushroom cultivation operations. Uh, mushroom cultivation is a labor intensive uh, work. And uh, when it comes to upscaling his uh, production, then he's going to require a lot of capital, in fact. So yeah, that, that also is a challenge for uh, the farmer. Okay, uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so here you are having a look at two pictures of the types of cultivations done in India. Um, on the left hand side, on the left hand side, you are having a look at seasonal cultivation. On the right hand side, on the right hand side, you are having a look at the setup for year round cultivation. So what seasonal cultivation is is uh, this is a type of cultivation that is done with low capital. It is done with the use of uh, bamboo sticks and wooden logs and maybe even sometimes a grow tent, essentially. And uh, so th this, this type of cultivation is accessible to the farmers and, uh, you know, the general public. And uh, but, but the problem with this kind of cultivation is that it is subject to climatic conditions. So, you know, the temperature is uh, something in the middle of the day. It is something else in the middle of the night. And yeah, the temperature just keeps uh, moving up and down in this kind of cultivation, which is not really suitable for uh, the optimum growth of mushrooms. And secondly, we have the uh, second type, which is called the year-round cultivation of mushrooms. Uh, this requires a high capital. You know, this type of cultivation is done with a well-established infrastructure with uh, growing rooms that are capable of uh, monitoring and controlling the parameters like temperature, humidity and all that. 
uh, it can provide consistent growing conditions throughout the day and throughout the year in fact and uh, this type of cultivation is known to give out uh, high productivity yeah so those are the two types of cultivations um, okay next we are going to talk about some common terms uh, that, that you need to know to understand mushroom cultivation uh, in the later part so firstly uh, what is a substrate a substrate with respect to mushroom cultivation is a suitable dead plant material which serves as food for the fungus we want to grow yeah we know that fungi are known to degrade plant matters dead plant matters so we are going to use that as a substrate to grow them on and next we have spawn so <clears throat> the spawn is an inoc inoculation medium which is carrying the fungus and uh, with respect to uh, the cultivations that we are going to talk about the spawn will be in the form of grain spawn okay we are going to use grains which will be carrying the fungus on them yeah so that is what spawn is okay a spawn is actually an inoculation medium guys first we have the substrate now we have to uh, inoculate the substrate right so that is what we do with spawn okay next uh, mycelium what is a mycelium so mycelium as we discussed earlier it is the cottony filamentous vegetative body of the fungus so once you mix the spawn and substrate together the uh, fungus is going to start growing out of the spawn and it is going to colonize the substrate and this white cottony growth that is colonizing your substrate that is what the mycelium is it is the body of the fungus yeah in that form um, next we are going to know what pasteurization is so pasteurization uh, with respect to mushroom cultivation uh, is heat treatment of substrate at a temperature of 60 to 70 degrees celsius so uh, yeah pasteurization is heat treatment at 60 to 70 degrees celsius and next we are going to know what sterilization is so sterilization is a heat treatment of a more intensive type actually it is heat treatment of the substrate at 120 degrees celsius at 15 psi you know if you have ever used an autoclave in your uh, laboratory if you are from a scientific background uh, so you know sterilization is uh, providing a heat treatment of a greater intensity and uh, this can actually reduce the microbial load on a greater scale than that of pasteurization talking about relative humidity so relative humidity is the amount of moisture carried in the air with respect to the maximum saturation so uh, to rephrase that you know if, if you are imagining a cubic feet of air it is inherently capable of carrying a certain amount of moisture inside it okay and uh, yeah that is what relative humidity is it, it's an indication of how much moisture is being carried in that cubic feet of air yeah and lastly we are going to know what biological efficiency is so biological efficiency is a measure of how uh, how much productivity this whole process has uh, given us okay so it is a it is a calculation of the weight of mushrooms you you are able to grow divided by the dry weight of substrate you use to grow this uh, multiplied by 100 so if i was able to harvest 500 grams of mushrooms using 1 kilo of dry substrate that would mean that the biological biological efficiency is at 50 percent yeah and uh, we have come to the last slide of the first part of our workshop um so uh as i told you earlier there are uh, So I believe that there are four com common steps in the cultivation of mushrooms. Um, the first one is called substrate preparation. The second one is called inoculation. The third one is called incubation. And the fourth one is called fruiting. And uh, later in the workshop, I'm going to explain the principles behind all these four steps. And if you understand just these four steps, 
you will be able to make yourself into an excellent mushroom grower you just need to understand the logic behind these steps uh, to understand mushroom cultivation as a whole so yeah uh, we are going to have a short q and a session now uh, regarding the things that we have already discussed and uh, we will continue after this uh, continue the slides after this q and a session so if you have any questions about what we just discussed i would love to answer them Sheetal, you had a question Miss Cynthia Bisoza, you had any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask questions. Okay, Deepak, let me read out one question from the chat box. Uh, yeah. Sangeet, I think Sangeet, I think Okay, uh, the Sangeeta wants to know uh, which one is the most cultivated edible mushroom in India, also in worldwide. And mm -hmm. tell me about the uh, Volvariella volvesia in India. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I am going to take that one. So, the most uh, cultivated edible mushroom in India and the world would be button mushrooms. Yeah, they are uh, widely available in India. Every vegetable you a vegetable shop you go to, you can find them there. And uh, yeah, it's button mushrooms which are most uh, popular. And uh, regarding Wolveriella volvesia, uh, this is uh, this is also I, I've been told that it tastes very very good. Uh, very uh, the taste the taste profile is very close to that of the button mushroom. And this is an outdoor cultivated variety. Um, the uh, cultivation is relatively easy and. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's it's also practiced in the northeastern states of uh, India, is what I know. Yeah, if if you want to know anything more specific about Volveriella, then yeah, you can uh, ask again, no problem. Okay, thank you, Dipal. Next question is from Ketaki. She would like to know. Uh, could you? Okay, she was she she had asked you a question. Could you talk about growing tent and what is the easiest uh, easiest way to build one? Did you get okay. the question? Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got it. So, uh, you know, a growing tent is actually an excellent thing. I mean, uh, I, we talked about uh, seasonal cultivation and year-round cultivation. And we as, you know, innovative people, we should be bringing the best of both worlds together. And uh, yeah, seasonal cultivation is, you know, easy on the pockets. And uh, the the benefits of having a grow tent is enormous i mean you can actually uh, integrate the climate control systems into the grow tent if you spend some uh, time doing research on that so yeah uh, grow tents are excellent and just one minute sir what was the question again uh, can you talk about growing tent and what is the easiest way to build one Okay, uh, if you want to build a grow tent, then you must actually do some research on which grow tents are insulated. You know, the a grow tent in terms of mushroom cultivation, it should be able to prevent the loss of, uh, you know, coolness. You know, the, the it should uh, be able to stop the exchange of temperature from the inside environment to the outside environment. So that is one quality that your grow tent should have. Yeah. And the easiest way to build one would be, yeah, you know, just just put a metal a metal framework, and you know, you use the grow tent to cover it completely. Yeah, that is how you would go about building a grow tent. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, can can Cynthia, madam, ask you a question? Yes, Cynthia. sir. Yes. No, no, wait, Deepak. Okay. Miss Cynthia Bisoza, would you like to ask a question? You have raised your hand. Okay, Shazina, you would like to ask a question? Yes, sir. I want to ask, uh, as sir mentioned in seasonal cultivation and year-round cultivation, sir pronounced that in year-round cultivation, we get high productivity. I want to ask that in seasonal cultivation, the productivity uh, productivity will be higher or lower? So, yeah, uh, in during seasonal cultivation, as I said, you know, the temperature is going to have a lot of variance. Uh, 
you know during the day the temperature is going to be on the higher side and during the night it's going to come back on the lower side so okay. this fluctuations they actually uh, impact the growth of both the mycelium and the mushroom you know if, if we were to do some uh, research on you know uh, a uh, mushroom grow back which is uh, exposed to natural conditions and one which is uh, you know being grown in a fully controlled environment the the second type would be obviously more uh, productive yeah so in simply we will get more productivity in year round but the productivity yes. will be uh, productivity will be limited in seasonal uh, i wouldn't say limited it's actually it actually depends on how well you do the setup you know people who do a uh, small scale cultivation they okay, use sir, very... I got the point okay, yes okay. it depends upon the conditions yes okay. yes how well the conditions are maintained in that setup yeah okay sir thank you i have thank done thank you uh, bodhi do you have any questions bodhi darma do you have any question okay uh sheetal wants to know from deepak can you throw some light over medicinal mushroom cultivation deepak so yeah uh, you know uh, medicinal mushroom cultivation also follows the same flow of procedure that we are going to discuss later on in the second part uh, it's just four things you know there you have a substrate which the fungus likes to grow on and then you have the fungus itself which is the inoculum you put them both together and yeah you incubate them for the fungus to com completely colonize the substrate and then uh, you simulate some other uh, parameters so that the fungus thinks that it's time to grow mushrooms so uh, what if, if i can know what more specifically she wants to know about i can answer better yeah maybe you can answer that later after the okay. workshop yeah okay yeah maybe vivian dias would like to know uh, she's asking you can you show how they look like oyster mushroom or butter mushroom how do they look uh, maybe in the second part of your presentation yes you yes sir, yes yeah yes okay uh, uh captain kirk would like to know will there be any discussion on exotic mushrooms like shiitake and lion's mane for example okay uh, these mushrooms are not really beginner friendly varieties of mushrooms and it would like take me a uh, a longer period of time to uh, explain it in detail and also the uh, difficulty of growing these mushrooms is also a little more complex and uh, yeah i i mean i am i'm going to talk about the cultivation of button mushrooms uh, lion's mane and ganoderma all three varieties but uh, you know it's going to be very brief uh, yeah in this workshop yeah okay okay thank you deepak uh, som gupta you have any question uh yes sir yeah, sir my please. question is that uh, mushrooms are known for their medicinal qualities and there are many researches which are conducted in india itself so why is there resistance in india for selling it and for uh, making it profitable because whenever i ask my friend about eating mushrooms then some people say that it's a dead food and some people say that it's not allowed in their culture so why is it so in india and how we can uh, cross it so we can make it profitable and we can make it known to more people so the so the answer to this question actually lies with the consumer himself if if we look at the statistics we already had a look at the market statistics and we have a very low per capita consumption of mushrooms uh, it is less than 50 grams per person so you know the average indian is eating less less than 50 grams of mushrooms uh, per uh, in a year so naturally that would translate uh, that uh, you know the indian consumer is not really familiar with the use of mushrooms so you know he might have a lot of misconceptions about them and that is why there is resistance yeah uh, the resistance is simply because he is not familiar with mushrooms to begin with i believe yeah thank you so please. sir if uh, okay sir okay yeah, thank please, you so sir, much so no, mr gupta please continue please sir i was saying that if uh, like uh, uh, people who are educated about mushrooms and people who have a mission to spread the knowledge about mushrooms if they do nice marketing campaigns and if they start uh, you know sir if they start growing and if they start educating the farmers the mushroom can have scope in future in india right yes definitely des definitely sir i mean uh, as we discussed earlier you know we have a lot of uh, people in here in india and uh, 
we need uh, more ways of generating sustainable food than what we already have and i think in the future these things will play out in a very nice way but it just hasn't happened here yet and uh, you know the, these days uh, all the people in india are tech savvy and and they are educated and and i think the time is uh, coming yeah okay so okay sir thank you so much thank you uh, deepak manohar raju says hi deepak and uh, he would like to ask uh, he would like to know answer for two questions uh, how do you source raw materials and from where so that is the first question okay um firstly we, you need to know what mushrooms you are growing uh, depending on that we would know which raw material it is exactly that you are looking to source and uh, how do you source raw materials you know these these raw materials are essentially agricultural wastes and there are quite they are quite easily uh, available if you just put some effort you know if you if you speak to a farmer or someone close to the agricultural field you will be able to source them without much difficulty yeah the second question is how do you maintain temperature and humidity deepak okay so uh, see uh, on in in the seasonal type of cultivation it's not possible to control temperature and if you are thinking about using an air conditioner that is really not recommended uh, the regular ac which we use at our homes is not suitable for mushroom cultivation yeah so there's really no method to control temperature in uh, smaller scales of cultivation but if we are talking about uh, uh, you know year round cultivation then there are machines that are capable of for doing that and in terms of humidity yeah so what people have been doing in seasonal cultivation is to raise humidity they just spray some cloth and on the walls and things like that so this is really inefficient and this is not the right way to maintain humidity what i would recommend is mm, there are uh, some equipment that are available uh, in the market for just some 4 to 5000 rupees you can actually buy a decent humidifier Uh, and it does a great job in humidifying uh, room of maybe you know a ten into twenty size. Yeah. Deepak Saurabh Mandal wants to know the difference between edible mushrooms and poisonous mushrooms, and how can we identify easily? Do you want to take this question or maybe skip it? Okay. Uh, I I am not really uh, well versed in the mushroom taxonomy area, so there is. Uh, so okay. there's no way to differentiate visually but yeah you need to yeah you need to the best way would be for you to take pictures of this mushroom and uh, you know there there's there are online communities that help each other in identifying mushrooms and you take good pictures of all the morphology how the stipe is how the gills are how the cap is and you record these details in pictures and you post in such forums where uh, people can identify the mushroom yeah I would like to request our mandal to attend our upcoming workshop on mushroom identification by Dr. Samantha Kapurna. Now, is the managing editor of my question. He is going to conduct a, a, a separate workshop on mushroom identification, also about the readability. Come, Mr. Saur Mandal, is that okay? Yeah. Uh, Sangeeta wants to know. Can you please tell me about shiitake mushroom cultivation in India? Is this possible easily? Okay. Um, there are actually very few people growing shiitake mushrooms, but I I know a certain I know a, a, some people who are growing shiitake mushrooms quite easily. And uh, no, it's actually I mean it it actually depends on which climate you want to grow this in, right? I mean uh, every type of mushrooms prefers a, a certain kind of climate, and uh, depending on where you live, if the temperature is forgiving for the growth of shiitake mushroom, then it would be best. or what you can do is you can uh, come up you can improvise ways to control the temperature yourself and uh, yeah that can also be done so if provided the right infrastructure and equipment are pre uh, present or if the right climate is present then you can grow shiitake quite easily uh, deepak rajat wants to know is it possible to commercially cultivate wild mushroom varieties of western ghat is there any effort relating to it okay is it possible to commercially cultivate wild varieties of okay i i think it's about it's possible to cultivate any mushroom uh, commercially really i mean you just take the mushroom from the environment you culture the fungus 
and the life cycle can be uh, replicated uh, quite easily i mean uh, logically speaking we can do it but uh, you know it, it only depends on the utility that mushroom is going to serve okay thank you deepak one more question so uh, mr manohar raju he has one more question so for what are the types of mushrooms you have been you have grown and what are the challenges you have faced for marketing okay uh, so i am uh, familiar with the cultivation of oyster mushrooms and milky mushrooms and some other medicinal varieties and uh, so what happens is uh, there is no steady market for these uh, kinds of mushrooms other than see button mushrooms have a very steady market uh sir can i just oh my god sir can right. i just uh, switch to wifi real fast yeah yeah i mean we'll take a break uh, we will come back after some minutes okay um yes sir and and, and uh, when we come back i'm again going to answer all of your questions yeah i'm having some issues over here yeah so and and i'm going to take your questions again and then we will resume the second half Sure, Deepak. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in five minutes because uh, Deepak is having some technical issues. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I was just using someone else's mobile, and yeah, I, I just need to fix something. Please don't okay. mind, guys. Okay. We'll be back in five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Deepak, you're back. Yes, sir. I'm back, sir. I'm back. Okay, good. Uh, maybe there was one question. It's like, uh, what are the types of mushroom you have grown, and what are the challenges you had faced? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let's let's take that. Uh, just one moment, sir. I'm just trying to look at the comment. So, what are the types of mushrooms that I have grown? So, I have been mainly growing uh, oyster mushrooms and milky mushrooms in smaller scales, and I am also uh, I've also visited a few button mushroom farms. I don't have very intimate knowledge about growing button mushrooms, uh, because yeah, button mushrooms just just the compost making itself is a science in its own. Yeah, um, yeah, and I also have uh, experience in growing some other. Uh, varieties like uh, 
yeah king oysters and uh, even lion's mane actually yeah. i i have been meaning to grow lion's mane i i uh, i've actually just gotten the cultures and i am in the process of making the spawn for that yeah deepak so if somebody wants to you know learn about button mushroom cultivation from, mm -hmm. from where they can learn about all these things of course you can go so, to youtube but hands on training who can give them sir so the way uh, i mean as far as i know dmr is the only institution where they actually grow button mushrooms that institution is meant to train people and they also have a functioning button mushroom farm over there and anyone who is really successful in uh, doing button mushroom cultivation would never you know let people inside his farm they are very secretive people these people who grow button mushrooms okay okay fine uh, let, let's take up the second question uh, around some of the last few questions um vivian dayas would like to know can we grow mushrooms in a dry climate uh, you know when we try to grow mushrooms the only thing that you need to first consider is the temperature Uh, where you want to grow the mushrooms, you first check the temperature of uh, the room or the area where you want to grow mushrooms, and depending on that temperature, you can actually narrow down on which mushrooms are best to be grown in that area. She meant hot and dry. Uh, yeah, a uh, hot. Okay, hot. I mean, club. Uh, yeah, milky mushrooms would be an ideal match in that case, I believe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fai Firuza would like to know: Can we? Only use agricultural waste compost to produce milky mushrooms. Mm, no, actually, milky mushrooms are grown on uh, substrates that are a little more. Uh, how do you say? Um, you know, compost is actually a secondary substrate. It's like compost means that the substrate has already been. Uh, uh, it has already under underwent some microbial decomposition. You know, that is what compost is, and. Uh, so milky mushrooms do not prefer to grow on compost they prefer to grow on a totally uh, how do you say a fresher form of the substrate if you if we are talking about compost then uh, compost is a substrate that has already went um, uh, went through some rounds of uh, decomposition yeah so uh, compost would not be ideal to grow milky milky mushrooms uh Deepak Rayan Ali would like to know what is the issue with regular air conditioners. What 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 is the issue with regular air conditioner? Probably in terms when when it comes. Okay to okay. So what they do is they uh, take the air that is already inside the room, they cool it down and they put it back into the room itself. So there is no fresh air coming into the room. Do you understand? मतलब it's just circulating the same air inside the room back into the room. and there is no inlet of fresh air from outside so there will not be an influx of oxygen if you use a regular ac that is the problem okay thank you all jeff uh, jeff randall rosari who would like to know uh, can you share the links to the workshop on identification of different types of mushroom i think that this is for me actually i will share the link uh, mr um, jeff i will share the link to that workshop on our, on my facebook or later okay Um, Abid Ali Mirani would like to know how can I develop new strains in oyster mushrooms? Deepak? Oh, I I would not be. I mean, this is actually way in over my head. I mean, I do not know how to develop the strain of oyster mushrooms. But I'm sure that uh, there are people who do advanced mycology and uh, who do like fungal breeding who would be aware of that. So we we just use uh, the cultures that are available to us. We may we take good fruiting bodies. we take tissue cultures out of them and that's how we make our spawn yeah abhi we will come back to you with this answer to this question okay in in, in one of the coming uh, workshops okay uh, abhi fine uh, jeff wants to know what are the techniques and procedure to collect and store the spores okay uh, yeah so what we need to do is uh, so the mushrooms will drop spores from the gills uh, of the uh, uh, from the gills of the mushroom so you know when you are considering a mature mushroom it would have a cap and then would, it would also have a stipe so what you need to do is you need to break separate the cap from the stipe and what you need to do is place the cap on a surface uh, on a clean surface and allow the spores to drop down on that Uh, surface 
so once you do this you can take up the cap again and you can you need to uh, store these posts somehow matlab uh, from that uh, surface yeah so mushrooms are dropping from the cap you just need to place the cap on a surface so that the spores would also drop on that surface yeah it's it's uh, it's as simple as that maybe there are some good youtube videos on that yes yes of course okay thank you uh, darshan wants to know uh, like he has a question some truffle species having mycorrhizal association with the tree he means to say there are some truffle species yes uh, yes which, which has uh, which uh, which have uh, mycorrhizal association with the tree how to establish the cultivation of this type so the cultivation of truffles is actually um, it's actually not uh, very clear matlab we we do know how to cultivate uh, okay okay uh, yeah so we cannot replicate all the types of truffles okay some type of the truffle making species we are already we know how to cultivate them so what a truffle is essentially is that when certain types of uh, mushroom growing fungi are uh, not given the fruiting conditions so they make some uh, they make structures called truffles uh, these truffles are, are essentially serving as the energy storage unit of this fungi and they grow underground because they are not finding the conditions to grow out mushrooms yeah so there are some types how to establish cultivation in this type no there is no uh, yeah so how what you what we do for the types that we are aware of is that we just make the mycelium we just grow the mycelium and we never introduce it to the fruiting conditions really and so the mycelium understands ki you know uh, i'm not getting the fruiting conditions and it will make uh, truffles on its own yeah the last but, but one question for you fibrosa yeah. is asking can you mention how we can utilize agricultural waste for mushroom production also mention the mushroom types i think you are going to explain this in com in coming uh, in the next presentation right yes 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 the, i am going, going to talk about the exact steps that we need to take nashika ravindran would like to know how to maintain the moisture level in the substrate after inoculation you are going to explain the same thing yes the, yes this will also be explained yeah captain kirk would like to know can we grow morel mushrooms indoors Uh, i believe that uh, the uh, the some techs have recently come up to grow morel mushrooms but uh, to be honest which i am not really well versed with uh, the cultivation of morel mushrooms yeah okay thank you deepak for answering all these questions and ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for asking these questions now we will move on to the second part of the workshop uh, where uh, uh, deepak will give in detail explanation for some of the things he has already talked in the presentation one uh the over to you deepak yeah thank you sir thank you so thank you guys for that interesting q and a session yeah that was very fun so uh so we are going to pick up where we left off i told you earlier that there are four common steps in mushroom cultivation you know and these steps are common for the cultivation of all mushrooms um so by understanding the principle behind why we are doing these four steps you will be able to understand the cultivation of all mushrooms if you just understand the logic behind these four steps so the first step step would be the preparation of the substrate so as i told you earlier the substrate is just food uh, with respect to mushroom cultivation it's just some material it's just some food that we are using using to feed the fungus and to grow the fungus on right so first we need to prepare that substrate the second step is inoculation also called spawning so we have prepared the substrate now we must add the fungus itself through a medium onto the substrate so that uh, you know it starts feeding on the substrate that step where we add the fungus inoculum into the substrate is called inoculation and it's also called spawning thirdly okay so now you have got the substrate you prepared the substrate you added the fungus now you must provide suitable growing conditions for the fungus to colonize this substrate right so this step is called incubation and it is also called spawn run and lastly we have fruiting so after the fungus has completely colonized the said substrate we must uh, 
make the fungus think that it's time to uh, you know grow out mushrooms and uh, these conditions are usually triggered by an influx of uh, humidity a uh, small drop in temperature and exposure to fresh air yeah so these are the four steps that are common for the cultivation of all mushrooms so now let's go into a little more detail about each of these steps so uh, first we will talk about the preparation of the substrate <clears throat> so the substrate is essentially a dead plant material a plant waste so here you are seeing the straw and then you can see sawdust corn cob waste and the last one is bagasse um oh so uh, a substrate is just food for the fungus to grow on it is a plant based material and some examples of substrate are straw bagasse compost sawdust corn cob waste cotton seed waste soybean hulls and even paper waste yeah all these things can serve as substrate for mushroom growing depending on which mushroom you are going to grow of course okay these substrates okay so why do we need to prepare the substrate okay so these substrates in their natural state they are loaded with microorganisms you know they grow out in the open environment you know on on mud and dirt and all these things so they are loaded with thousands of types of microorganisms and what we need to do is we need to get rid of all these microorganisms because when we add the inoculum these microorganisms might actually end up competing with our desired uh, fungus so what we need to do is we need to get rid of all these microorganisms and how are we going to do that so uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to soak the said substrate in water overnight and uh, after that you need to subject it to heat treatment now pay attention because it is very important that you soak these substrates overnight okay i'll tell you exactly why um, these substrates not only have microorganisms but they also have microbial spores in them and these spores might inherently have some uh resistance to heat i mean they might be heat resistant these spores uh, they are they are meant for uh, surviving tough conditions and they might end up uh, resisting this heat so what happens when you soak these substrates is uh, these these spores will think that you know uh, they are finding moisture and uh, they will think that the climate is suitable for them to germinate by soaking the substrate overnight you are making these spores uh, to germinate they will go from spore form to their germination form and once it has come out of the spore form it is no longer uh, resistant to it and it is susceptible to your heat treatment so that is why it is important that you soak the substrate and overnight and and then you subject it to heat treatment so uh, by doing the heat treatment you are going to kill all the microbial population and it will greatly reduce the number of microbes that our desired fungus has to compete with in the medium yeah and uh, heat treatment is usually done either as pasteurization or sterilization depending on the substrate so you know uh, different substrates have different degrees of uh, microbial population and different types of microbial population i mean the profile would be unique to the kind of substrate and it is uh, heat treatment as pasteurization is recommended for certain substrates and while whereas uh, some substrates would require more intense sterilization so yeah uh, these are the two ways we can use to uh, reduce the microbial uh, population of the substrate and also we must also ensure that the substrate has desirable moisture content in it post heat treatment you know someone was uh, asking about Uh, maintaining the moisture content of the substrate so while uh, doing this uh, uh, pasteurization either with steam or water uh, immediately after uh, it uh, comes out of the pasteurization step it's going to have a lot of moisture in it if you are doing uh, pasteurization by hot water or a boiling method then naturally it's going to be saturated with water so what you need to do is you need to let all that water uh, strain itself and uh, maybe even uh, make it to dry for a couple of hours and uh, the uh, optimum moisture level at the time of uh, inoculation 
should be around 60 percent yeah so uh, so that is how you prepare the substrate you soak it overnight and then you uh, give it heat treatment and then you make sure that uh, after heat treatment that uh, there is a desirable moisture content inside the substrate itself yeah so that is how you prepare the substrate okay so now you have uh, you know you you killed all a majority of the microorganisms in the substrate you have uh, set an optimal uh, moisture content inside the substrate and now comes the step of inoculation adding the fungus onto this prepared substrate okay so in this step we will be mixing the prepared substrate and the grain spawn together inside a container so inoculation is going to be done uh, through grain spawn at least with respect to uh, this workshop i mean what whatever we are talking about here the inoculation can uh, even happen uh, through you know uh, liquid cultures and spore syringes and things like that but you know we are not going to go into detail about all that we will only talk about grain spawn as it is the main medium of inoculation for commercial mushroom growing yeah and also you must keep in mind that inoculation needs to be done in a very clean environment both the substrate and the spawn must be handled with clean hands so you know in the previous step we just eliminated all the uh, most of the microorganisms in the substrate and uh, after pasteurizing it if you're just going to handle the substrate with dirty hands or uh, you're going to pl place the substrate on some dirty surface you know it would be counterproductive you know you're just adding more microbes into it again you're you're spoiling the whole process of you're spoiling that which you have achieved by uh, doing pasteurization so yeah and it's uh, it's it's uh, it must be noted that post uh, substrate preparation both the substrate and the spawn and all the things that they come in contact with must be clean okay and the ratio of substrate to spawn is specific to the type of mushroom being grown so how much spawn do i add for how much substrate that is something specific to the mushroom being grown so you know we are just talking about inoculation as a whole we are not really talking about a particular mushroom yet so yeah uh, it's dependent on the mushroom the third step is called incubation or spawn run so this is uh, on the, in the first in the first step we prepared the substrate second we added the inoculation in the medium of grain spawn and now we must incubate uh, this uh, mixture uh, in a place that is facilitating for the fungal growth the conditions for optimum fungal growth should be maintained during incubation Yeah, as I told you before, we are going to provide optimum growing conditions for the mycelium uh, to completely colonize our substrate. The uh, yeah, well, whatever optimum temperature is that particular mushroom is known to have, uh, that that particular mycelium uh, should uh, is known to have. We must we must provide that temperature to it. And also, it is important that we allow gas exchange to occur during incubation. You know, mushrooms don't the colonization phase doesn't really require fresh air exchange but it does uh, require a certain amount of gas exchange though i mean the, the whatever grow bag or uh, container you're going to uh, put the substrate and spawn in it should not be airtight that is what gas exchange means so if it's not airtight then it it, it pretty much means that gas exchange is allowed yeah and maintaining relative humidity and co2 concentration inside the grow, grow room is not required the only parameter that you need to control during incubation is temperature okay uh, the humidity and giving it fresh air just forget about all that during incubation phase next next we are uh, okay uh, in the in the, during the incubation phase the fungus has colonized the uh, substrate and now the final step comes which is fruiting okay fruiting is triggered by the influx of aerial oxygen humidity and a slight drop in temperature you know as you know in nature mushrooms come up uh, right, right after a day of rain 
you know they they they, uh, they they are quite intelligent beings they know that the humidity is high after rain so they plan their life cycles accordingly so when we are trying to do this under man made conditions also we must simulate the conditions of rain um the three parameters that uh, we need to control during this uh, phase is we must we must provide optimum levels of temperature we must give it a high relative humidity and also fresh air exchange and we must also facilitate a slight drop in temperature guys yeah uh, mushrooms absorb aerial humidity and direct watering should be avoided so mushrooms love humidity but that doesn't mean that you know we are going to spray water directly on them uh, the water should always be provided to the mushrooms indirectly you should grow you should spray water around the mushroom growing bags and into the air essentially by so 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 that you increase the humidity in the air and you know you're not trying to water the mushrooms directly yeah so to summarize all the four basic steps of mushroom cultivation first we are going to pasteurize or sterilize the substrate we are going to mix the substrate with grain spawn inside a poly bag like container and we are going to make pin holes for gas exchange you must facilitate gas exchange yeah and the third step we are going to incubate the mixture and allow the fungus to colonize the substrate completely and lastly we introduce conditions that facilitate mushrooms uh, the fruiting of mushrooms yeah these are the four common steps for the cultivation of all mushrooms guys first you pasteurize the substrate you inoculate the meat um, the medium carrying the fungus and then you incubate and allow the fungus to colonize and then you introduce conditions uh, which encourage mushroom growth so these are the four steps uh in the next slide we are going to have a very rough overview of the cultivation of button mushrooms ganoderma and lion's mane with respect to the four steps that we just discussed so while growing button mushrooms we are using pasteurized compost as the substrate we inoculate that compost with 5% of mushroom spawn we incubate that mixture uh, at 21 to 26 degrees for 20 to 30 days and uh, when the uh, fungus has completely colonized the substrate we introduced fruiting conditions which are uh, a temperature of 14 to 18 degrees celsius a carbon dioxide concentration of less than 1000 ppm and a rel relative humidity of above 90% next on the next column we have ganoderma uh, the substrate used to grow ganoderma is sterilized sawdust and uh, the way to inoculate it is with uh, an 8% ratio of uh, grain spawn and uh, we we are uh, and we are going to as we discussed earlier this inoculation step is done in clean environment guys and uh, you know th this uh, mixture is incubated at uh, 21 to 27 degrees for 20 to 30 days and uh, for fruiting conditions we will have to maintain a temperature of 18 to 24 degrees celsius a carbon dioxide concentration of less than 2000 ppm and a relative humidity of above again nine uh, above 90% yeah and on the third column we have lion's mane to grow lion's mane we are going to use sterilized sawdust as the substrate again we are going to inoculate it with grain spawn with a ratio with a spawn rate of 15% and uh, we are going to incubate that mixture for 21 to 20 uh, for uh, at uh, 21 to 24 degrees for just 10 to 15 days and for fruiting we are going to maintain 18 to 24 degrees celsius of temperature a carbon dioxide level of uh, less than 500 to 1000 ppm and a relative humidity of above 90 to 95% so yeah there you have it you know these are the four steps exact four steps that are being followed for the cultivation of these three varieties of mushrooms yeah so that is why i i told you guys that these four steps are uh you know you need to understand the principle behind uh, doing all these four steps okay now that we just uh, talked about just the steps in general now we are actually going to getting to the 
cultivation of particular mushrooms. Uh, so we are going to talk about the cultivation of oyster mushrooms first. I will try to speed things up. Um, so why should we do oyster mushroom cultivation? Oyster mushroom grows on a number of substrates. It grows on a variety of substrates. It uh, and it grows in a wide range of temperatures. Yeah, the temperature range of growing oyster mushrooms is prevalent throughout India. So it is very suitable for most uh, climates. They are the easiest mushrooms to cultivate. It's not very difficult to cultivate. It's very beginner friendly. It has a high biological efficiency. The productivity is great. If I used uh, one kilo of dry substrate to grow oyster mushrooms, if I do a good job, then I might actually end up with more than one kilo of fresh mushrooms. Yeah, it has high, very high biological efficiency. It is less prone to contamination compared to other varieties. Yeah, so oyster mushrooms are not uh, as susceptible to contamination as some other varieties. Oyster mushrooms promote heart health by reducing risk factors like cholesterol and high blood pressures. So oyster mushroom is really uh, healthy also. It, and uh, yeah, it, it's good for heart health of the consumer. They are rich in vitamin C and B complex. So they also have a rich nutritional profile in them. Uh, so the first step in cultivating uh, oyster mushrooms would be the preparation of substrate. And the oyster mushrooms are very popularly grow on, grown on straw as uh, that substrate is known to give out very high biological efficiency. And it's also very easy to handle. Straw does not need to be, uh, it doesn't need to be sterilized uh, like sawdust. So straw, the straw only requires pasteurization, which a lot of people can do easily. Yeah, so we are going to do oyster, uh, do oyster mushroom cultivation with straw uh, right here. So first we would need to give it heat treatment. Um, so what we'll first do is we will cut the straw into small pieces of two to three inches of length. I mean this is I mean this can be even more uh, in in length. It doesn't matter uh, greatly as long as it's not too long. Um, then we are going to soak the cut straw overnight and uh, then on the next day we are going to give it heat treatment with either hot water or steam. If it's with hot water it should be for 60 to 70 degrees for 60 minutes and if it is with steam then the temperature would be 80 to 90 degrees for 90 minutes. You know steam takes a little bit of time to penetrate into the inner uh, part of the substrates so yeah it, it takes a little more time so after heat treatment you are going to strain and remove the excess water and ensure that there is around 60 percent moisture in the substrate yeah so after heat treatment you must make sure that it is it has an ideal uh, level of moisture and how do you check this okay you can check this uh, moisture level by performing a simple hand squeeze te test so what you do is you take a handful of substrate and squeeze it tightly as tightly as you can in the palm of your hands and uh, on doing that if there are many droplets of water dropping down to the ground that means that it's too wet so when you when you do the squeeze uh, your palm should get completely wet and there should not be many drops of water falling onto the ground if, if it's just one drop of water it's fine but you know if it's multiple drops of water hitting the ground then it means that your substrate is too wet so okay uh, oh this is actually a very nice picture taken from uh, freshcap.com uh, this is showing a setup uh, using which you can pasteurize your substrate you just have a heavy gauge metal drum you put your substrate in there you load it with water you weigh the straw down with something heavy and then you use fire to increase the temperature yeah so yeah this is one good way to uh pasteurize your substrate okay once uh, this pasteurization is done now comes the second step which is inoculation and you know as i told you earlier these steps must be performed in a clean area with clean hands so how we are going to inoculate uh, oyster mushrooms i'm so sorry guys so uh, how we are going to inoculate oyster mushrooms is that uh, we are going to take a polythene bag or it can also be made out of polypropylene and first we are going to fill it with a three to four inch layer of straw substrate okay first we are going to fill it with a three 
to 4 inch layer of straw substrate. And then we are going to add roughly a handful of spawn. A handful is roughly close to 10 grams. And we are going to just distribute uh, this uh, uh, grain spawn evenly on that 3 inch layer of substrate. And then what we are going to do, we are going to add another 3 to 4 inch layer of substrate. And then again spawn, again substrate, again spawn, again substrate. And we are going to uh, finish filling the bag with a last layer of substrate and not spawn. And after the bag has sufficiently been filled, we are going to close the mouth with a rubber band. Okay, now, now that we have closed the bag with a rubber band, uh, rubber band uh, it, it, it's actually quite, it feels uh, kind of airtight inside. So what we must do is we must make four pinholes on all four sides of the poly bag to facilitate gas exchange. We don't want the grow bag to be airtight. Okay, and the mycelium needs a certain level of gas exchange. So we are making pinholes. So yeah, that is the process of inoculation. And next, uh, we have made the bags and uh, we have uh, facilitated gas exchange. Inoculation is done cleanly. Now, uh, the prepared poly bag must be kept for incubation for the mycelium to colonize the substrate. So here we will provide suitable conditions for the spawn to completely colonize the substrate. The ideal temperature for the colonization of oyster mushroom mycelium would be around uh, 23 to 27 degrees. Okay. While incubating this oyster mushroom grow bags, we must maintain a temperature of 23 to 27 degrees. Maintaining relative humidity and fresh exchange is not required. Only this temperature needs to be maintained while incubation. You don't have to do anything else. There's no need to spray water. There's no need to open windows or anything. Yeah. And the incubation phase ends when the mycelium has completely colonized. So then comes the fruiting phase. Fruiting is triggered by introduction of fresh air and humidity and a drop in temperature. So what we need to do to in induce fruiting is, uh, first we would need to make two slits on opposite sides of the bag. Uh, these slits can be just two to three centimeters in length. Um, they are essentially exposing a certain part of the mycelium to fresh air and humidity. And uh, uh, it's, it's just giving space for the mushrooms to grow out. And that is why we make the slits. And during fruiting, uh, you must, uh, maintain an optimum temperature of 23 to 26 degrees and a relative humidity above 95 uh, percent yeah so you need to maintain the said temperature and you also need to maintain high humidity and uh, you are, and one more parameter that you would need to control is the fresh air yeah when when the fruiting phase uh, begins these are the three parameters you need to take care of Temperature, humidity, and fresh air, guys. Yeah. Avoid. Uh, you must avoid spraying uh, water directly on the mushrooms. As I told you earlier, you must give them water indirectly by increasing the relative humidity of the air inside the room. You know, direct watering of the mushrooms should be avoided. And mushrooms should double in size every 24 hours if the right conditions are provided. Yeah. If if you if you do a good job of uh, maintaining these three parameters, then the mushrooms will essentially double in size every 24 hours. And lastly, uh, we are going to talk about harvesting. So before harvesting, uh, at least four to five hours prior to harvesting, we must reduce the humidity levels inside the growing room. Now, mushrooms are like sponges and, and if you, and when you give them water, they hold it in the outer surfaces. And uh, if you if you provide them water right before harvesting, it's actually going to affect the shelf life of the mushroom negatively. So to harvest the mushrooms, you must hold the mushrooms at their base and twist them while uh, also pulling them outward to harvest the mushrooms. Oyster mushrooms have a shelf life of two days and it can be extended up to four days if it is re uh, refrigerated, guys. Okay, so that is oyster mushroom cultivation for you guys. I'm just going to quickly summarize all the steps so that you can see a clear full picture of the whole process. Okay. First, you are going to pasteurize the straw substrate 
uh, with heat treatment and you are going and post heat treatment you are going to set the moisture content to 60 percent okay and and then you are going to uh, mix that prepared substrate with the grain spawn inside a polythene bag and you are going to poke small pinholes on the grow bag to facilitate gas exchange thirdly you will incubate these grow bags uh, for 23 to 28 days at 23 to 26 degrees uh, and you are only going to maintain temperature uh, during this phase and after complete colonization you are going to introduce fresh air humidity fresh air and humidity into the growing room and uh, you know uh, trigger the mushroom formation in on the colonized growing bags and lastly you are going to harvest them i hope that is clear okay uh, so that is oyster mushroom cultivation for you guys um, if, if if anything is not clear, uh, then I'm more than happy to answer it in the Q&A session that's going to be held later. Um, next, we are talking about the cultivation of milky mushrooms. Okay. So the significance of milky mushrooms. Milky mushrooms can grow in warmer climates near to 35 degrees. So, you know, oyster mushrooms can be grown in most climates, but there are also some coastal areas and some... Uh, temperate areas that have a, a more average temperature uh, and uh, mil milky mushrooms are very suitable uh, for these kinds of climates they have a high shelf life yeah milky mushrooms can uh, uh, can be stored even without refrigeration it can be stored for one week and with refrigeration it can be stored for two weeks it has a very high shelf life milky mushrooms have a visually appealing big fruiting bodies yeah, so milky mushrooms, they are, uh, in the, as, the, as the name suggests, they are milky white to look at. And uh, the fruiting bodies are huge. And uh, a single milky mushrooms can weigh up to uh, 200 grams if uh, grown in the right conditions. And milky mushrooms also have a high biological efficiency. So yeah, uh, uh, on, uh, by measuring it with the amount of substrate that was used to grow mushrooms you know they give a relatively high output and milky mushrooms can also be grown on a variety of substrates just like oyster mushrooms milky mushrooms they strengthen and regulate the immune system it is also said to alleviate some symptoms of asthma and other allergies it is also said to have an antibiotic anti-tumor anti-cancerous properties uh, it is known to help in regulating diabetes, lowering bad cholesterol levels, and to have strong antioxidant properties. So that those are the medicinal benefits of consuming milky mushrooms. Okay, now let's get down to the uh, process of doing uh, growing uh, milky mushrooms. So again, we have the preparation of the substrate. Guys, I just want to let you guys know that the cultivation of milky mushrooms and oyster mushrooms is not very different. The uh, the it is it is very similar with the exception of just one step, which is called casing, which I'm going to talk about later. Okay, so to begin growing uh, milky mushrooms, first you need to prepare the substrate. You know, just as you did with oyster mushrooms, you are going to cut it, cut the straw into small pieces. You are going to soak them overnight and then you are going to subject it to heat treatment uh, either with hot water or steam and uh, you are going to st uh, strain or remove the excess water to set the moisture level to 60 percent uh, you can perform a hand squeeze test to check the moisture level yeah okay so now you have prepared the substrate and now you are going to inoculate it so the inoculation is also very similar to what we discussed earlier you are going to take a poly bag, you are going to fill it with a 3 to 4 inch layer of substrate and then spawn and then you are going to repeat the layers and end the layer with the last layer of substrate. And you are going to close the mouth of the poly bag with a rubber band and you are going to make pinholes for uh, to allow gas exchange. So it is exactly like uh, the uh, what we studied earlier. So inoculation, that is inoculation. So now comes incubation. So, uh, you know, oyster mushrooms were uh, liking another temperature range, but milky mushrooms prefer a totally different temperature range. 
so milky mushrooms like an ideal temperature uh, range of 28 to 35 degrees which is why they are suitable for warmer climates um, the polybags must be incubated in a dry shaded location for about 30 to 35 days yeah so incubation takes a little longer than oyster mushrooms uh, here so the incubation time is around 30 to 35 days that is how long it takes for the milky mushroom mycelium to take over the whole straw substrate yeah uh, the only parameter that you need to maintain during incubation is temperature no need to worry about humidity and air exchange so okay up until here you know the steps have been very similar to the cultivation of oyster mushrooms but now we are going to learn about casing guys so you know you saw that oyster mushrooms like to fruit from the sides of the bags but uh, milky mushrooms usually prefer to fruit from the top of the bag and uh, they also require a casing material for good fruiting to occur so yeah in this picture you can see uh, there is a grow bag over here on the bottom on the bottom part of the grow bag it has colonized substrate and on the top it has some one to two inch layer of uh, a material which uh, we are going to call the casing layer okay so once the substrate has been fully colonized by the fungus what we are going to do is we are going to add a layer of casing material to facilitate the growth of mushrooms and this is very important guys <clears throat> for the growth of milky mushrooms so talking about casing in a little more detail so the casing layer is crucial for the growth of milky mushrooms they provide physical support moisture retention and also an excellent microclimate for primordia formation so those are the benefits of using casing layer they provide physical support they help in moisture retention and they also provide a microclimate for the mushrooms to begin forming so uh, what should be what should we be using for casing layer? Now, there are actually many recommended mixtures of casing layer, but I personally would recommend pasteurized cocoa coir co or cocoa pith with close to 50% moisture. Okay. Remember, this is pasteurized cocoa coir, guys. You're, you're not going to get cocoa coir and use it as you uh, wish. You, you know, just how you pasteurize the substrate, you also need to pasteurize this casing layer as well, casing material as well and this uh, casing material should also have a moisture close to 50 percent okay uh, so after complete colonization of the substrate we must open the poly bag you know we have uh, closed it with a rubber band right we open that and uh, on top of the substrate we are going to add a one to two inch layer of casing material um, which is uh, we are just going to add a one to two inch layer of cocoa coir guys yeah so uh, the mycelium now uh, has uh, some casing layer on top of it and it actually has to run through the casing layer it has to travel through the travel upwards through the casing layer and then it needs to reach the top for fruiting to occur and this phase is called case run you know the running of mycelium through this casing layer is called case run it takes another 3 to 5 days for the mycelium to run through the casing layer yeah so that is how long it will take for the mycelium to run through this casing material and once it has uh, you know it has run through the casing layer now it can begin fruiting so in this phase we will provide a growing condition for the mushroom bodies to fruit uh, as we discussed earlier and uh, we are going to do this by misting the growing room and maintaining high humidity we are going to provide a lot of ventilation inside the growing room and we are going to maintain the temperature at 27 to 34 degrees celsius it's only a little bit lesser than what we have been maintaining during incubation because we need to simulate a slight drop in temperature yeah i mean ideally so mushrooms mushroom pens will start to develop and reach maturity in five to seven days after case run so after the mycelium has run through the casing layer it will take another five to seven days for the mushrooms to um, start forming and reach uh, maturity so yeah that is the fruiting of uh, milky mushrooms lastly regarding harvesting 
you know it's the same you know you hold the mushrooms at their base you twist them and they'll just pop right out and uh, uh, before doing uh, harvesting you must reduce the humidity inside the growing rooms for four to five hours and uh, as i told you earlier milky mushrooms have an excellent shelf life they can go up to seven days without refrigeration and maybe up to 15 days if they are refrigerated okay uh, for those of you uh, who are having a hard time following this this is a summarization of all of milky mushrooms so first we are going to pasteurize the straw and uh, prepare the straw and uh, you know set a moisture content of 60 percent then we are going to mix the grain spawn inside a um, grain spawn and substrate inside a poly bag and we are going to make pinholes for gas exchange and then we are going to incubate these poly bags at 28 to 35 degrees for 30 to 35 days and after the full colonization has occurred then we are going to add a one to two inch layer of casing on top of the substrate and we are going to allow the mycelium to run through that layer and once that has happened we are going to introduce fruiting conditions and which will you know uh, encourage the formation of milky mushrooms guys i hope that's clear so lastly we are going to have a look at the factors that affect mushroom growth uh, there are only uh, three parameters that you need to control during mushroom cultivation, which is temperature, relative humidity, and CO2 concentration. Now, now just pay attention for this last slide, guys. I know this has been very long, but uh, yeah, the, the, the workshop is almost coming to an end right here. So, uh, so these are the three factors that affect mushroom growth, the three parameters and uh, some other factors are cleanliness and homogenization of the ingredients you know mushrooms and fungi are sensitive to other microorganisms so all the steps must be uh, done in a relatively clean manner and homogenization of the ingredients you know when you make the poly bags it, it should not be like you know the bag is too wet towards one end and too dry towards one end or you add uh, too much spawn towards uh, the bottom and the spawn is too less at the top you know it, the concentration of ingredients should be even at all the places and this uh, can also have a significant impact on your growing operation so yeah these are the factors that affect mushroom growth guys and uh, this is what you need to keep an eye on okay uh, so the workshop is almost finished now on uh, for closing notes um yeah, uh, so a lot of the applicants were saying that they wanted to be entrepreneurs and they wanted to do the mushroom cultivation business. Okay. So I just want to tell them, ki, uh, you know, as I discussed earlier, you know, it's easy to grow mushrooms, but, you know, the real challenge is in the selling of mushrooms. And uh, one needs to come up uh, with innovative ways and create their own marketing channels to sell their produce and which is actually possible guys i mean all these years we were not that uh, you know market savvy but i think people are upskilling at a very good rate and i think pretty soon uh, we will be able to come up with ways to sell these mushrooms as well and also i would like to say that mushrooms are still unexploited in india you know, a man is known to exploit every other thing. Uh, we exploit all the things that we are not supposed to exploit. But mushrooms seems uh, mushrooms seem uh, like the perfect thing, and and they're it's almost like they're meant to be exploited. And we should be reaping more benefits out of these uh, mushrooms and fungi, basically. And lastly, I would like to say that you know, after attending this workshop, the only kind of setup that is accessible to everyone is the seasonal type of cultivation okay so just because you are uh, doing seasonal cultivation doesn't mean that you it has to be all uh, very crude right you you don't you you, um, you must not spray water on the ground to maintain humidity guys you should actually invest a little bit of money and buy a humidifier it's going to do a much better job at maintaining the humidity okay and uh, you know for for fresh air exchange what people uh, doing these types of cultivations would do is they would open a window or two and think that uh, you know uh, air exchange is occurring this is this is not right uh, what you must do is you know so you spend a thousand or two thousand rupees
to buy an exhaust fan install it on one of the windows if you just do the buy these two machines i i promise you your uh, yield is going to increase significantly so yeah that is my uh, uh the suggestion so with that we have come to an end to this workshop and now we are going to have another q and a session for uh, people who did not understand anything during this uh, second part so thank you deepak let me read out the questions from the chat box okay sir okay uh, Mr. uh captain kirk would like to know how about the lighting uh, what about the lighting how much light while going indoors mm -hmm. okay so mushrooms actually do require a certain amount of light and again the light is uh, the amount of light is specific to the kind of uh, mushroom being grown but you know as far as uh, the uh, i mean regarding the types that we discussed and for other mushrooms as well it's not a greatly contributing factor in my opinion i mean you know in nature also you know the light is only available during the day and during the night it's so uh, dark and uh, even while growing it indoors there is a certain amount of ambient light that enters the room even if you have not provided the light uh, just the ambient uh, light would be sufficient for many types of mushrooms thank you deepak uh, manohar raju has two questions for you first question is how do you check chemical residues in sawdust hmm well, i i i'm not really sure about this um, how do you check chemical residues in sawdust I, i'm i'm not aware of any techniques to check uh, chemical residues okay yeah, second question will be inoculation will be done in laminar airflow or in empty box okay so see again this actually depends on the type of mushroom that you are growing uh, if you are growing a mushroom that is very sensitive to contamination then it has to be done under laminar airflow but for the type of mushrooms that we discussed and even for button mushroom cultivation nobody uses a laminar airflow to cultivate uh, i mean to inoculate these substrates um so yeah inoculation is not a sterile step for many mushrooms but only for the uh, some sensitive varieties of mushrooms yeah okay shita do you have any questions uh yes uh deepak uh, i i wanted to thank you for this uh, uh, nice session first uh i have a question uh how do you mentioned that uh, co2 concentration monitoring is essential so how do you exactly uh, monitor uh, the co2 well, concentration to be honest with you you know unless it is a year round cultivation we don't have means to monitor it all we can okay. do is uh, mechanize it in such a way that air exchange is constantly occurring you know if i as i told you uh, we mm -hmm. must use uh, use uh, machines like exhaust fans inside our setup right Hmm. right yeah so so do by doing that you know we we can be sure that uh, enough air exchange is occurring inside the growing room if you really want to monitor it then i suppose uh, there are equipments and uh, probes yeah that, th that is what i exactly wanted to know is there yeah. any instrument or equipments available yeah, yes there, there is definitely uh, there are definitely instruments that can measure co2 but you know i i've never mm -hmm. had the pleasure of using one myself to be honest okay yeah okay thank you thank you Cynthia madam do you have a question Shazina Shazina do you have a question for Deepak Yes sir yes sir i have a question Yeah please go ahead uh, Sir as we are uh, talking about cultivation so we can cultivate artificially in any month like march is the best season like moisture content is available naturally this is the best season for growth but artificially we can grow in winter in summer okay okay so you know moisture is something that we provide inside the growing room and uh, see uh, you, the primary thing that you need to consider is the temperature moisture is something that can be provided even if there is not uh, if the air is not carrying so much moisture with we can uh, find ways to fix that but uh, since you are talking about seasons you know the main thing that you should be concerned about is the temperature what the temperature is during summer and what the temperature is during winter for example in here in karnataka and southern states of india what we do is we prefer to grow oyster mushrooms during the winter 
and in the summer we switch to milky mushrooms that is what the seasonal growers do so yeah temperature is the main factor here and you should uh, see look at what temperature you are having and choose a species that is going to do will do well in that temperature So if we want to grow it commercially, we can grow it in either winter or summer, maintaining the temperature. I mean, first you will have to decide on which species uh, you are going to grow, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was a very nice session, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Abhi Dali, do you have any question for Deepak? Uh, yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, sir, hi Abu. Uh, have you ever uh, developed new strain in oyster mushroom? Uh, to be honest with you, no. Uh, we only use the cultures that are already available and that are popularly grown. So we make spawn for commercial growers, and okay. uh, they have a pretty much set um, number of varieties that they are known to grow. Like for oyster mushrooms, there are a number of varieties, but the most cultivated one is called Hu. It's his I guess Ulmeria, I think. Sir, uh, mostly uh, I am working on butter mushroom, and there is okay. a, a uh, and there is a psyche behind it. We are not able to uh, uh, grow culture on media through mushroom body, but mm -hmm. I saw some oyster expert. They can uh, grow easily and making spawn uh, via fruiting. But what's the uh, science behind them? I I am not really sure. I mean, can you just repeat the question? Uh, the thing is that uh, in Oster we just take uh, uh, fruiting part uh, on right. uh, media, uh, which mm -hmm. is PDA or something else. Mm -hmm. But uh, why we are not able to take uh, agricus biosporus uh, uh, culture in our media? What's mm -hmm. the so, reason behind? Mm -hmm. See, I, I, I see. We do a cult, a culturing of button mushrooms also in our spawn lab. Okay. Yeah, and and we actually use uh, the same media as well. You know, okay. we either use PDA or MEA. I, okay. I okay. think okay. Uh, being very specific about the type of uh, buttons you are growing. Sir, uh, if I am not wrong, it's just maybe just because of hybrid strain. That's why we are not getting yield as much as uh, Dutch and other countries. I, I'm sorry. Can you can you please come again? Um, I thought that it may be just because of uh, uh, hybrid strain in agriculture. Hyper. That's what? why hybrid 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 uh, strains. Okay. Okay. That's why maybe we are unable to get F1 generation in our oh, no, no, media. No. I, I'm not being able to understand your question clearly. Um, uh, I I say that sir, uh, in butter mushroom we usually uh, have strain uh, um, uh, spawn uh, which we buy from other like Hollander and other companies. Right. They may be they may be give us hybrid strain, so that's why mm -hmm. we are unable to take uh, uh, culture from fruiting bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if 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 you are if the if the species of mushroom it is itself deviates in any way, then the yeah. culture that it prefers, the compost that it prefers, and you know the such micro things would would also mm -hmm. definitely change. Yeah. Okay. Sir, have you ever used uh, spawn growth promoters like uh, fertilizer? No, actually, yeah. The, this is actually it's a very intriguing subject. And uh, my previous employer had worked on making a a compost okay. enhancer. He called it, yeah. But yeah, uh, you know, we haven't really gotten ourselves into it very deeply yet. Uh, sir, can you share with me a yield uh, on five kg substrate? Yield on five kilos of substrate? Yeah, yeah. Of which variety? Uh, uh, Pleuritus austerus. Okay, I mean, yeah, the yield would be somewhere. See, if you are maintaining good conditions, the yield should be above a hundred percent of biological efficiency, because okay. oyster mushrooms are known to give out more than hundred percent of biological efficiency. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir, for your. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Deepak, uh, Ashika yes. Rajendran would like to know how will we know the moisture in substrate is mm -hmm. about sixty percent. 
so it there is uh, so we don't have a proper way to measure uh, exactly 60% commercial but uh, what we can do is as i said earlier we can perform a squeeze test you know you take a handful of substrate in the palm of your hand uh, so you know this is this is a very crude way of measuring the substrate but uh, this a is field method. we call it field method uh, i'm sorry so we call it field method uh, field method okay, okay yes yes okay yeah i'm i'm calling it a, a squeeze test <laughs> yeah <laughs> both are sir right 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 so so what you do is uh, you take a handful of substrate and you squeeze it really tight and if you have droplets of water coming down from that substrate then it would mean that it's too wet basically but uh, you know in in terms of setting the moisture level you should keep in mind that if the moisture is a little less than desirable then that is okay you know if it has a little less than 60% that is quite all right but if the moisture becomes too much it is going to attract bacterial contamination and it's going to cause a lot more problems so you know um, so yeah that's the uh, principle behind that uh, is that clear ashika ravindra can you respond no okay never mind uh, mr babu blaze babu you have any question okay sir why we are doing tissue culture for the spore production as well as spore we can use the spore for making tissue culture any reason mm -hmm. for that okay okay that's a very good question so what happens is every spore has a set of uh, genetics you know the the mushroom is dropping billions of spores into the environment and each spore has a unique uh, what genetic profile you know yes uh, each spore has a unique speed of colonizing it has unique it has unique traits basically and uh, you know it's very hard to pick one subset of characters from those many spores but what happens during tissue culture is you are already taking a very good fruiting body and you are uh, yeah and you are essentially doing a tissue culture on that to save that set of genetics uh, are you able to follow yes sir yeah yeah okay so that is why we do tissue culture rather than spore culture in uh, commercial mushroom growing yeah thank you so much sir yeah thank you uh, deepak darshan has a question for you in, in india which ganoderma species are used in cultivation uh i have to be very honest with you i am not uh, very familiar with the cultivation of ganoderma uh, i would not be able to is there any specific mushroom specific media not the media species okay. species are used to cultivation okay uh you okay. can you can skip that the uh, the is okay yeah yeah i i i am not really well versed with the cultivation of ganoderma to be honest session we will come back to you uh, about this question in uh, next uh, workshop okay so, okay sir okay sir nice no apuja gavas has a question deepak during spawn run do we need to keep the filled poly bag in dark or is it not necessary it is not necessary just you don't need to the only parameter that you need to control is temperature yeah and and ambient light would be there anyway thank you uh, deepak fairuza has uh, one question i guess so to my knowledge there are many challenges in organic oyster mushroom production contamination by trichoderma black fungus is a major uh, one among them can you suggest measures to overcome this uh, there are only there are only two measures that you need to take one would be proper pasteurization or sterilization of the substrate and after uh, doing that you know if if it is a if it is a variety that is really susceptible to such contamination then you can do inoculation in under a laminar airflow yeah the you know, proper pasteurization and using laminar airflow for inoculation this will make your uh, procedure full proof yeah okay deepak rajat has a query for you question for you how to prepare a spawn okay so what we do is we take a fully developed and a very nice mushroom fruiting body we make a cross we may we cut it in, right down in the middle and we take a little bit of the mushroom's fruiting body uh, the inner tissue of the mushroom fruiting body and we place simply place it on the culture media 
yeah so that uh, you know eventually colonizes the uh, culture media and that is what we use as inoculum for our further uh, grain propagation yeah so uh, you know it, it might not be very clear from what i said but uh, yeah the spawn making is a little more um, but uh, complicated than mushroom cultivation so if if there was a way to visualize uh, what i am talking about then you would have an easier time understanding this maybe there are some youtube videos on this right yes 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 there are definitely some videos yeah rajat uh, you might actually like to visit youtube and find some relevant videos okay uh, darshan has a, qu a question for you deepak is there any specific mushroom specific media for basic isolation of strain if yes which company is good okay we use pda and mea to uh, what what media for basic isolation of strain i hope you mean like uh, taking a culture so for making cultures we use uh, pda and mea yeah and which company is good we we we, we i mean it really doesn't matter pda is just potato dextrose agar and anything that you can buy from a uh, uh, what lab supplies uh, a labs Material so supplier. Other than PDA, any specific media which are meant for only mushrooms? Sir, sir, we use uh, PDA and MEA, sir. Those are the only two ones that we are uh, using currently to make spawn for. We make spawn for just three varieties, sir: oyster, milky, and buttons, because they are the ones who are uh, which are widely cultivated, and they they are the ones which are in demand. So yeah, we kind of work on demand, to be honest. Okay, sir. Thank you. Deepak, uh, Mr. Cynthia Disosa has a question for you. Uh, where can we get this spawn from? Can you provide uh, details? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I will uh, find a way to. Um, yeah, I probably should have dropped some uh, social media handles into the presentation. But uh, if you if you can somehow contact me after this workshop, I will be glad to supply spawn for you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mrs. Cynthia Disuza, Deepak would be happy to supply this spawn for you. Uh, as I know you, as you are from Udupi area, you could contact uh, the scientist from Agriculture College, Brahmavara. Is that clear? Mrs. Cynthia Disuza. Anyway, um, uh, Shazina has uh, one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. Uh, sir, my question was basically related to contamination. As you told, to avoid contamination, we should sterilize and pasteurize. But once the contamination is introduced in our media, so the media is wasted. Are there any way to handle the contamination? No, I mean with respect to uh, you know uh, when you say media, you mean the substrate media or like on the petri plate, like where we are doing the spawn. Where exactly? Uh, like petri plate media. Oh, petri plate media. See, uh, um, if if uh, the if there are two types of organisms growing on the same petri plate, and uh, yes. especially if it is bacterial in any nature, then we should avoid using that plate altogether. And if it is fungal, and provided uh, it is in such a stage, ki, you know, uh, there are uh, if the cultures are overlapping each other, then you could. Possibly try to subculture the, a cleaner part of that, and try to salvage it somehow. But you know these microbial cultures can be like they are like omnipresent. You know it's impossible to uh, get a very uh, clean section when there are more than one types of fungus or any other kinds of microorganisms growing on the same plate. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So yeah, it would be difficult. It would be difficult to uh, do a subculture of a plate which has. Or different kinds of organisms going growing on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Deepak, we are taking the last question now. Uh, Mr. Amok uh, has a question for you. You mentioned that a single milky mushroom can be up to weigh, uh, weigh up to twenty grams. Mm -hmm. How does uh, one know that the mushroom won't grow anymore? Well, it will just stop growing. I mean, yeah, it, it has a limit. It can't keep growing forever. So naturally, it will reach the uh, end of its growing st uh, stage, and it will just come to a halt. Uh, thank you, Deepak. Can you please switch on your video? Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, Deepak, if you can please switch on your video. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank sir. You. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it has been a wonderful uh, two hours, um, almost two hours, 15 minutes now. Uh, if you still have some questions for Deepak, please go to his uh, Instagram account, maybe Facebook account, uh, Fungipedia, okay? And, and um, ask him, uh, he'll be very happy to answer your queries there also. And he'll be available on WhatsApp also. I will send his details. Maybe Deepak, it will be okay, right? I'll share yes, your... Sir. Yes, I'll, sir. I will, I will, I'll, I'll share... Uh, I will share the WhatsApp number of people uh, for and if you guys are interested to you know, interact with him. Um, our last question, I don't want to disappoint this lady. Aparajita Banerjee would like to know what type of certificate we need if you want to open lab for spawn production. Deepak. Well, I, I, I mean, there's no, uh, it's not a requirement uh, or anything, but uh, yeah, but if you want to do spawn production, then you probably must take some kind of training from some already functioning spawn lab. Yeah, uh, I don't know if there is any certificate that uh, comes for that, but uh, maybe if you contacted some government type of institutions like DMR or IIHR, they will be, I mean, yeah, they all give certificates. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Parajita, for that question. And thank you, Deepak, for answering that question. Uh, uh, Deepak, I would like to thank you very much, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, for uh, giving, uh, conducting this uh, workshop in a very, very effective manner. You know, it has been a wonderful one, almost 150 minutes, so much like around 145 minutes, 150 minutes. I'm sure all the participants have benefited greatly from your knowledge, your eagerness to share the knowledge. That is very important. And uh, and uh, we are very, very privileged to have you here today. And thank you very thank much. You, and thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to come in front of all these people and speak. Yeah, and I would also like to I would just like to mention that uh, uh, Bele Damodar Shanai sir was uh, kind enough to bless me with this opportunity and I would like to just say thanks to him. Yeah, thank you Deepak. We will let you go now. If you want to stay back, you can stay back. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. yes. Sir. We are going to have an online quiz. If you guys, are, if ladies and gentlemen, if you are interested in receiving a certificate of complication, you must complete this assessment quiz. This assessment quiz uh, uh, will have 20 multiple choice questions. If you get 10 out of 20, you will be eligible to receive your uh, certificate of completion. Okay. I will share the link on in the chat box. Please attempt the quiz and complete in 20 minutes. Is it clear? Please respond. Yes, sir, clear. Okay. Let me share the link now. Yeah. Uh, Fairuza, we have a WhatsApp group. Uh, okay. Um, I will share the information about WhatsApp group later. First, please attend the you know assessment quiz. Okay, I have shared the link. Also, sir, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, so, if any of you want to follow my Instagram account, you are more more than welcome to. We actually keep sharing very educative and informative content about mushrooms and fungi. My Instagram account is called fungipedia.in, guys. You know, like you're uh, typing in a website, you you search for fungipedia.in and uh, you will be able to find us on Instagram. So please do follow me on Instagram. That would be really helpful for me. Deepak, would you mind sharing the slides with the participants? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can share it here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to share these slides with all the participants and registrants, okay? Along with that, okay. I will share the contact details of uh, Mr. Deepak Gowda, founder of Fung Fungipedia, okay? Thank now, you, Now, please attempt the assessment quiz. I have shared the link here. You have 20 minutes to complete it, okay? 